Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to CC English Service. Um, so very glad that you all could, could join us today. Uh, before we get started, I'm um, just going to take some time to run through some announcements. Um, so we, we've been showing this for the past couple of weeks. Um, the, the gist is that um, we're asking everyone to, to start wearing a mask um, in, inside the church. Um, as, as a church, we've been reading the Bible together. Um, the Bible reading plan is, is on our website, so if you'd like to follow along, uh, you know, head to the website for, uh, for the details. Um, there's a couple of events throughout the week that, um, uh, you know, we, we can uh, help connect to uh, each other. Um, starting with, on Tuesday night, we have a, a prayer meeting um, at 8. Uh, we have a Wednesday night, 7.30 uh, p.m. Uh, fellowship. Um, and then we also have a, a Friday night uh, fellowship that's, that's uh, in person um, at church. Um, as always, we have English Sunday School starting before the, uh, before the service. Um, and uh, just a reminder, we, we do, CEC does have a benevolence fund for the families who are in need. Um, if you or somebody you know, of, you know is, is in need, uh, there, there's a link in the, um, in the PowerPoint uh, for more information. Um, now, now that we're back in person, of course, we um, you know, accept offering through the offering box. But if you'd like to pr uh, pay or give offering online, um, you can use your bank's uh, bill pay system uh, to do so. Um, Lastly, if, if uh, you ever want to talk and chat with Pastor Emmy, um, he's always available and his contact information is, is on the screen there. Um, before we get started, I'm actually going to invite up Daisy. Um, sh uh, we, the church has been hosting VBS uh, this past week. Uh, Daisy has been helping run. Uh, Daisy, you can come up uh, to, to run VBS. Um, and so she's going to share a little bit about um, how the week went um, and things like that. And we also have a short video uh, prepared afterwards. So. Thank you everyone for uh, having me here. I uh, just wanna have a short sharing with you guys. Um, so last two weeks, uh, uh, two weeks ago, we had VBS during uh, in our church in person, uh, which is kind of like, to me, it's impossible, you know, during the pandemic, like uh, we go back, we could uh, have the VBS in person. So it's all, you know, Lord's uh, provision and guidance. And we praise the Lord that uh, even though there were a lot of uncertainties, and but uh, the Lord is, uh, you know, always faithful. So we had um, we had uh, 17 kids around on the first day, um, but at the last day we have like 24 kids, and also um, we have around uh, 10 kids accept Jesus um, during this event. So yeah, we want to give all the glory to the Lord and. Yeah, I just want to quickly share a verse with you guys. Um, it's in John 10. Uh, chapter, uh, it's in John 10, verse 10. So the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. Um, so, you know, uh, during the pandemic, we can see a lot of um, conflicts, right? Conflicts between nations and nations cultures between between cultures and even people against people um, but like through this VBS what I see it is uh, unity in our church um, you know people from different background like from English congregation you guys uh, help us a lot um, Grace Mara and a lot of like you pr even you didn't come but you pray for our event pray for our families and Chinese congregation also youth you know they um, they help us a lot, so I definitely see the unity in our church. So, yeah, just want to give all the glory to the God. Thank you. And here's the video. Yeah. treasure god knows me god hears me god is my comfort i am his and there's nothing better forgiven and chosen forever i am a treasure
God says that to each one of us, as you are chosen, you are my special, special son, my special, special daughter, and I am your father. And he chooses us to be to be his. Thank you for choosing us. Thank you for choosing us. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for loving us. Help us to love others. Help us to love others. Help us to learn a lot. Help us to learn a lot. During this last day of EBS. In Jesus' name. In Jesus name. And everyone says, yeah. Right? Yeah. yeah. We all believe in the one true God. Just the you do. The second day was what? God hears you, okay? Third day was God. God comforts you, okay? Fourth day was God forgives you. And the last day today was God. Aren't those really important things to know? Praise God for, for all the things that he's doing um, through the, the volunteers. And, and also thank you all for, for your prayers uh, for this time as well. Um, at this time, uh, if we could all rise, um, let's take some time to, to greet those around, uh, socially distanced greeting to, to those around you, um, and uh, remain standing uh, for, for worship. <laughs>
and pray dear father we thank you for this beautiful time lord to come before you to recognize that you alone dwell in a place where everything is well you are a holy awesome mighty god you are almighty lord the economy in your kingdom is doing well you cannot be impeached and you won't resign. We thank you, Lord, for your son, Jesus Christ, that you have given to us, that you have expressed your love towards us in sending him to die on our behalf. It is in his name that we cry to you, Abba, Father, today. It is in his name, Lord, that we once again look upon our own lives and ask, Lord, for areas that need to correcting, rebuking, changing, transforming, refining. Lord, we thank you for the forgiveness that we have received in Christ. We continue to ask that your spirit will be at work to transform us into the image of your son, Jesus. At this time, Lord, also please receive a portion of that which you have blessed us with. Lord, may it bless the ministry and your kingdom expansion here at CEC. Lord, also prepare our hearts as we approach your word. And Lord, we continue to pray for the situation in this world, for the church at large, for the people who are your ambassadors of the gospel around the globe. And Lord, for all the congregations that have gathered in your name to praise you today. We join the choir of angels as well. And we thank you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Uh, you may be seated. At this time, I would like to invite up uh, uh, 
Grace and Jonathan, if they're here, present right now. Um, are they here? Oh, okay. Grace is here. Is the Are we ready with the slides? Okay. Um, you probably know them well, but uh, they have been um, at this church for quite a while, and uh, I know that at least uh, you know Kevin, who is uh, part of the worship rotation here at our church. He is, is he your nephew, Grace? Yes. Okay, nephew. your nephew. Uh, please come up, and uh, they will share with us from their ministry, and, and they're part of the Navigators, so praise the Lord. Uh, which microphone will they use? That one? Okay, so... Hi, everyone. Hello. Um, again, it's a joy to return home, and um, I'm part of CEC since uh, 1986. That's quite a while. And uh, at the time, I was a graduate student and then uh, worked as a software engineer here in the area until I went to Russia for a couple of years and then came back, got my lovely, got married in 95 and then we left for uh, Central Asia in uh, 97 and we have two kids, we came back in 2015 and we moved to the headquarters, uh, Colorado Springs, and continued to uh, be part of missions by sending new missionaries. So here's a little bit of uh, the PowerPoint, what we are doing right now. Do I have a click? So we, just like many of the sending organization, we send missionary all over the world. And some of them in very difficult places. So our responsibility is just, you know, provide the uh, overall vision and coordinate all the na uh, US navigators, missionaries, appointees from Canada school through departure for the field. A lot of different preparation, including fundraising, uh, sometimes cross-cultural training. Um, so here is a, a little bit of our data so far this year. Currently, we have about more than 210 missionaries overseas. And even though during the uh, pandemic year, in this year, we appointed 25 individuals getting ready to go overseas. Together, there is 34 in total in preparation. So some of the 34 is like got stuck here until the border opened. And we are thankful that recently we can send 12 people overseas. We have uh, a lot of challenges that we face nowadays. Just want to share with you a little bit. Um, <clears throat> one of the real challenge is persecution. As you have seen, uh, most probably coming our ways in country like Afghanistan. <clears throat> and then another challenge is the extreme poverty and wealth. Uh, Sometimes we don't remember how to go after the um, forgotten, the extreme poor. And uh, we, we call it the 
high hanging fruit and the low hanging fruit. I mean, in Oregon, you can always go to the orchards to pick peaches. Um, if you remember, you know, sometimes you look at the one higher up, it's difficult to reach. So you have to bring a ladder and carefully, you know, not to, not to fall down. So we call that the high hang hanging fruit. And even in some of the country, you can say there's a high hanging fruit people in North Korea, and uh, we are making plans to do that. And the general migration, and uh, there's a term called the Aspara Ministry, and uh, people are everywhere. We have um, Syrian refugees who came to Christ in Lebanon. So there are a lot of challenge to you know, meet the demand. Um, we are short in developmental resources because the expansion is not in step with population growth, including laborers. We need people to go and finance resources. What is our response? This is very familiar. This is what Jesus is sharing with his disciples and the crowd, the need. And specifically, Jesus asked the disciples to pray. So that's the minimum, the first step we need to do is to pray. Another one, Isaiah. What will be our response? Because God is literally saying, whom shall I send? Who will go for us? Here I am send me now before I go overseas before I went overseas I was an engineer I pray I support missionaries I joined the missions committee I visited missionaries and I went on short-term mission this is my experience so what will be your experience? And pray and ask the Lord what you can do, how you can participate in your own capacity. So I just want to thank my family member, uh, continuous support for many of our years overseas, and even now as we send more new missionary to the field. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, that was uh, a fresh reminder. Unfortunately, I have uh, been damaged by marriage I've been in over two dozen missionary trips before I got married, and since I've gotten married only once. And, uh, you know, I'm uh, negotiating with the next church that once my kids get older, that every two years I will get at least a one month sabbatical, if not longer, so I can be back on the mission field. Uh, growing up, David Livingston was one of my faith heroes. So. Yeah, thank you, and uh, may the Lord guide you as well in your walk uh, with the Lord. Okay, at this time, if you have a Bible, please turn it ready to the fourth chapter of the Gospel of Mark. We have been going through a series on the parable of the sower. We are about halfway through. We have at least two more sessions after this one. Um, in this uh, uh, series, 
and uh, I hope that uh, you will be blessed uh, through it. If you would like to participate with us, as it was said earlier through our readings through scriptures, we basically alternate and read one chapter a day and then the next two chapters. It'll take anywhere from three to five minutes a day to follow the teaching in Sunday school, in the fellowship time, and in the worship service will be primarily taken from the previous week's reading. As a church, uh, we are on this road together up until the end of this year when we'll have finished going through the scriptures together. I will now read the parable again, but I will highlight the area in which we are going to uh, look at. And uh, let me let us be reminded that during this time, Jesus uh, yells at the people. He's speaking to them, and once of a sudden, he says, Listen to this, making it important for us that our hearing is especially important. And today we are looking at the second type of soil. And he says that as the sower went out to sow, other seed fell on the rocky ground where it did not have much soil and immediately in sprang up because he had no depth of soil. And after the sun had risen, it was scorched, and because it had no root, it withered away. And we see here uh, our Lord um, with the disciples uh, together. As soon as he was alone, his followers, along with the twelve, began asking him about the parables. And I'm not going to repeat it again, but I've explain to you why Jesus, uh, from this point in his ministry, began to teach in parables the population. Uh, that is not by the design, but it's a response of judgment because the five areas of society had rejected him as Messiah. And uh, we see also parables come within the context of, uh, of judgment in the Old Testament as you know, we also looked at Nathan, how he approaches uh, David about his sin with Bathsheba. Uh, but there's something about the relationship about us and hearing God and, and having and developing a hearing relationship. And I remember when I first came here, I told you that one of the spiritual formation disciplines in your life and in my life is a lifelong process that we call committing to hear God's voice. In John 10, the Lord says, I know my sheep and they know me. And they know my voice. Here is uh, a famous uh, devotional, My Outmost for His Highest, uh, um, Oswald Chambers. And he writes on this phrase, As soon as he was alone, his followers, along with the twelve, began asking him about the parables. And he was saying to, the, to them, To you has been given the mystery of the kingdom of God, but to those who are outside, get everything in parables. So let me read what he says in his devotion and time alone with the Lord. He raises the question to you and I. I'll read a couple of paragraphs. Have you ever been alone with God? Our solitude with him, and remember so I also gave you Another one of our spiritual disciplines is spending time in solitude. Jesus does not take us alone and expound things to us all the time. He expounds things to us as we can understand them. Other lives are parables. God is making us spell out our own souls. It is slow work, so slow that it takes God all time and eternity to make 
a man and a woman after his own purpose. The only way we can be of use to God is to let him take us through the crooks and crannies of our own characters. It is astounding how ignorant we are about ourselves. We do not know envy when we see it, or laziness, or pride. Jesus reveals to us all that this body has been harboring before his grace began to work. How many of us have learned to look in with courage? We have to get rid of the idea that we understand ourselves. It is the last conceit to go. The only one who understands us is God. The greatest curse in spiritual life is conceit. If we have ever had a glimpse of what we are like in the sight of God, we shall never say, Oh, I am so unworthy. Because we shall know we are beyond the possibility of stating it. As long as we are not quite sure that we are unworthy, God will keep narrowing us in until he gets us alone. Whenever there is any element of pride or of conceit, Jesus cannot expound a thing. He will take us through the disappointment of a wounded pride of intellect, through disappointment of heart. He will reveal inordinate affections, things over which we have never thought he would have to get us alone. We listen to many things in classes, but they are not an exposition to us yet. They will be when God gets us alone over them. This was his reflection on this passage. I am glad that after my own reflection, we see a lot of things in common. And as we have seen in the first study and the second study last week, especially when we talked about the hardened heart, we talked about self and pride and how pride is the chief end sin of human beings and it fuels self. <clears throat> and he said to them, do you not understand this parable? How will you understand all the parables? Because this is the chief parable that opens the door for, to us about the kingdom of God. And the Lord says that the kingdom of God is among us. It is within us, within you. In a similar way, he's speaking now about the seas that fell on the rocky uh, soil. He is saying, in a similar way, these seeds, or the Word of God, are, uh, this are the ones who, I mean the, the rocky soil, the ones on whom seed was sown on the rocky places, who when they hear the Word, immediately receive it with joy. And they have no firm root in themselves, but they are only temporary. Then when affliction or persecution arises because of the Word, immediately they fall away. So basically, we will have to now look and, and revise. Jesus, we saw that, is the sower. There is, let me tell you, there is a way for us to always share the gospel. And I've explained to you many times, one of the easiest ways is just to have a track. Um, you know, you walk on the streets and you pass people tracks and you ask questions and sometimes they talk to you. And, you know, you may be clothed with prayer, you do this, and uh, it is great. It is great that you're doing this, and most of the time you'll get disappointed. Because I will tell you that most of the time what you will find is the very first soil, which is the hardened heart or a passing message. You speak and what you say goes in one ear and it comes out the other ear. That is the hardened heart at which we looked last week. But sometimes you see that there's people who have an emotional response 
or they may say, oh great, what shall we do? Or they may respond to the message of the gospel in, wow, now it makes sense in my mind about this and this and this. And there's a great joy and excitement about the truth of God. In this case, there is implantation. And when you see that, you realize, yes, I guess I've been used by God to share truth, to share the gospel, but literally, it is the work of the Spirit and Jesus that can begin to move in the place where this word reaches. We see here that there is only one type of seed that produces fruit. There's nothing wrong with the seed. There's nothing wrong with the sower. When you are human-centric, what, guess what you do? Something must be wrong with the missionary. Something must be wrong with the pastor. With the style they have. When Jesus shares the word through the Spirit through you, he will do the work. He will couple with his work. How will they, how will they believe if they do not hear? Salvation belongs to the Lord. We are only vessels through which God or Jesus may use us, but the Spirit has to be at work within the person for that truth to take place and to work. And making disciples over the years, all the way to, you know, I was still a leader, a youth leader, like an assistant pastor. And some of my youth and people in college had become pastors or missionaries. And I, I had trained them. And I had yet to become a full-time pastor myself. Because I was always busy. I was always serving in the church or on the mission field. Um, I, I hadn't gone to seminary yet. And I knew I was going to go. And everything was happening. And, and it, it is beautiful to see how the Lord moves how the Spirit is at work. And surely enough, when you experience this, the Lord will testify to you that there is only one sower. That is our Lord Jesus Christ. And His message is perfect. And, and we have heard this from Paul. He says, I did not come to you with eloquence of speech that I may take away from the power of the gospel. It is only through the avenue of experience that you are mature enough not to point your finger at the instruments of the sower or to complain about the method of the seed. That is simply something in your heart that comes through a, a problem of maturity and to the yelling of Jesus. Hear this because... It's not about you getting out those doors and say, I didn't like his message or his message wasn't good. The weight that Jesus puts on you in his kingdom is to go outside this door and to say, have I heard God today or not? That is the weight on your soul before him. Have I heard his voice? Church cannot be a church, and I keep repeating this to you, until through worship, you interact with his presence. And through the sermon, you hear him speak. And that is the weight in how the spirit in your life works with the ministry of his spirit in this world and in his church. Okay, so now that we've done an introduction, we call this rocky soil uh, something of a of a shallow heart or a shallow hearer. But as we looked at the explanation of this parable in, in Luke chapter 8, we see how do Christians hear? Christians do not hear with their ears. Christians hear with their heart. And the heart in the Hebrew understanding is the seat of the soul. And what is the soul compromised of? 
And uh, as we explained it already, I'm not going to take too much time, and I gave examples in the last couple of weeks. You have the intellect, which is the most shallow part of, a, of the soul. You have the emotional aspect of the soul, which is a little bit deeper. And you have the volition or the will part, which is even deeper yet. But all of those three, by the greatest commandment, tell us, have to be captured by the love of God. What is the greatest commandment? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, with all your strength. Now you see why Jesus emphasizes this parable above the others and how important it is for us who are involved in kingdom work. Jesus wants not only your intellect, not only your emotions, not only two out of the three, but he wants to make you wholly his. Therefore, all of those three areas have to be what? Surrendered to him. I want, this is the same guy named Paul, I want to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I guarantee you, Paul would not get a job as a pastor in the United States. He would come and he would sit here and says, this is the power of Christ in me. He'll tell you his experience about the, the, the cross and resurrection of Jesus and how he transformed his life. He would sit down. He would not leave church until all of you got up and did the same thing because he says, now I want to be encouraged by you. So you tell me about the reality of the power of the cross of Jesus Christ in your life. And everyone in the church would come up and share their testimony of how that is a reality and a power. This is what happens. Those things in your life need to fully experience the cross and resurrection of Jesus Christ. This is, you know... An entire chapter was given to this, to the account of the cost of discipleship. And many people uh, write books on discipleship because we have to talk about discipleship because now the seed is not only passing. This is temporary, but nonetheless, there is implantation and there is some growth. So we have, whether we like it or not, the process of discipleship, even if it's temporary, it somewhat takes place. Even though there may be shallow faith, a shallow heart, we're just awaiting how this temporary thing is going to collapse. And that's what we're interested in today. How many of you have heard of the benediction order of monks? Any of you? Do you know what happens? You go in with no possessions. You're not allowed to bring any possessions. You go in with your clothes, and they give you a room, and they give you their clothing. I think they call them habit, your habit priest, priestly robes. Yet they let you keep your clothes for one year. So in your room, you have nothing, a bed, and your clothes that you came in. Why? Because they know about the cost of discipleship. They know about this soil, the rocky soil, and the thorny soil that we will look at next week. And they said, let's count the cost. Let's give them time. After one year, during this year, at any one time, they can take off their, their, their monks' robes, put them aside, get them into their worldly clothes that they came in, and leave. No questions asked. But after one year, they remove those clothes. And now they stay there. So that's something that happens for them. Even they recognize. And you wonder, how come we don't hear more crazy stories? Because, I mean, these guys or these nuns, they have to go through some crazy stuff. To it's because they know about this, and the door is always open. One year. That's a long time. 
Okay, so let's look more closely at the shallow heart or the rocky soil. This is a heart that is superficial. In a shallow heart, the word is heard and implanted in what we would call a superficial uh, way. This sometimes is called, because it's easiest to explain, as an emotional hearer. But it can be an intellectual hearer, it can be a volitional hearer, and they look at different aspects, and we're going to look at that, how each happens. But what happens is that when you have bad rock, you get soil that holds moisture very well. It's very thin. And then the seed gets planted, it holds moisture, it has a lot of good nutrients. But as the rains begin to stop and the sun rises, the seed begins to grow. It's an incredible uh, place to grow because of the nutrients that are so rich and the moisture. But because the roots cannot go deep, the plant grows very quickly upwardly. And therefore, the expression, it's extremely strong. Many times I, I talk to people uh, and they think, you know, Pastor, I'm not doing so well. I mean, look with you. Yes, maybe in a certain area the Lord is still working in you to have all the elements of your soul be fully surrendered and work there. But it doesn't mean that there's something is just wrong with you. And then they go, wow, what happened? They were so on fire for the Lord, and after two years, I rarely see them ever come to church again or be involved in any work or ministry with the Lord. A shallow heart, superficial people, right? Do we have this type of people? Have you had shallow friends in your life before? No? People who want to use you for a certain reason. Right? Shallow friends. When do you know your friends? In good times or in bad times, your true friends? In bad times. That's when you know your true friends. And this is what happens with the people where the Word of God, the Gospel is planted... They're all joyous and exuberant and hardship begin to happen at different levels, at the mental level, the volitional level, or emotional level, and they fall away. The heat comes, the moisture dissipates, and the roots are too shallow. They cannot uphold the growth, so eventually the plant collapses before it can produce fruit or other seeds, which is the very purpose of that plant's life. Which is, by the way, your purpose and our purpose. Because the image that we have in the Old Testament that we are a wild forest and we are grafted into the, this dead stump, this olive tree that was Israel and it was fruitless, from which the shoot of Jesus Christ, the shoot of Jesse grew, and a new olive powerful tree is. And now we as non-Jews are being grafted in the New Testament, the Lord takes this analogy and makes it a vine. And he tells us that in the vine, we are grafted to be fruitful. This process, now we see why this parable is so important. It attracts so many of the images that the Lord uses about our purpose, about salvation, about the transition of his message across our humanity. Okay. Can you move forward for me, please? Let's start with the one that the scripture starts about, the emotional hearer. Now, I haven't spoken about this, but we spoke about the hardened heart which is the passing one. The seed is right on top of the hardened soil. The birds come and take it. The work goes one year, comes out. The mind is the battlefield. This, you will say, well, isn't this the same thing? And in a way it is. You just have to move that crust of hardness a little bit deeper. And now you have to guess for a shallower here, 
as you are a fisher of men, and many times you will find this, you will have to see which part is where the seed is at. And you have to be careful because one plants the seed, one waters and grows, and then the Lord of the harvest, one harvest through the Lord of the harvest, the seed in. And this is part of the beauty of being a laborer in God's uh, uh, vineyard, in God's garden, that you will begin to see. And some people are emotional hearers. They are affected in their feelings and emotions by the gospel. Initial contact is great, uh, but the problem is that we need to have all three parts surrendered of the heart. So when difficulties arise or tough situations or tough conditions, and they, they face persecution or loss, or they have to deal with suffering and grief, many of them will fall away. Tragedy, death, complicating ethical issues wrap them up emotionally and they fall apart. Similar to the scorching plant that has no support. This is an emotional hearer and we see this quite often. In certain, and what I've seen, you know, now the Lord, I was counting with my wife, the Lord's used us to share the gospel with 31 different nations across the globe. We've made disciples of 31 different countries. And I tell you, certain people groups are more prone to be a certain type of hearer versus others. From the Latino community, this is more prevalent than you think, to be an emotional hearer. Do you know who I call the Latinos of Asia? The Koreans, they're very passionate. The Koreans, I call them the Latinos of Asia because they are very passionate and very emotional uh, in their expression as well. And in that regard, you will say, well, that's bad. But in that regard, they're also great because that is also a part for people who struggle in the emotional area to surrender to the Lord. This is more common in the western side of the world. The intellectual here. They, at a mind level, the message makes sense. The problem is the message has not gotten to the place where they can act it or live it out in their life and therefore there's a cross there, or the message has not dealt with the cross of their feelings. I meet with a married couple, and the wife says, something is wrong with my husband. And I meet with the husband, and the husband's a brilliant man. Brilliant, extremely smart, extremely successful, wise. Uh, you know, there's almost uh, nothing that you can say. Uh, the problem is that he was emotionally bruised as a child. Bruised, abused, and God has never entered in there. And what I'm trying to say to you is, not that those places the Lord wants to make holiness, but these places that have formed a crust now become a place in your soul that empower self and pride. Empower self and pride. And believe it or not, even memories need to be brought before the cross of Jesus and healing from memories need to happen. Even when healing from those memories happens on your soul, it's simply like in the flesh. You get a big cat and a gash, and it heals, and you, it forms a scar. You'll notice that scar is slightly more sensitive than the rest of the skin around that scar. And something like that may still happen. I know from working with women who were raped, or from, from people who were slaves, or enslaved, or caught into certain tragic situations 
even after the healing happens at the soul level, the area is sensitive, to say the least. So negative impact of relationships bring hate, jealousy, rejection, hurt. This is where the crust or the bedrock may happen. Also, people don't respond with their will to put into action truth and conviction, just like we saw in the, in, in the, in the hardened heart. If you don't, that will form a crust in your volition. And therefore, it will render you unfruitful in the kingdom. And you may fall away in a certain time of adversity. Some try to even maintain a Christian countenance. But underneath, when you look, they're really a burning pot of mixed feelings. You know, I, I look at people from this generation. They say, we were raised this way, but now the thinking of this world is this way. And they're a mess. They don't know where to land. This is an extremely bad epidemic with millennials. Selective of emotions, we soon become blocked and incapable of authentic relationship. People who have a hardened heart can't have a relationship. People who have an issue deeper cannot have an authentic relationship. Marriage is a good place for you to see. And you say, well, I know some pretty bad marriages that look pretty good. And I say, yeah, do you know why? Because the self in both marriages are drawn together by idolatry. So they found that strong bond. But that's still only a shallow marriage. It may look better than other marriages who are in Christ, but still struggle through those areas of their heart. Until this husband gets healing from his past that I've told you, he's not made whole. You know, and initially you meet people like that and say, wow, I'm impressed about this guy. I wonder what's wrong with that wife. Why is she complaining? It's also got to review your authentic relationships if you are in a marriage. Say, Pastor, I feel like you're judging me. No. I'm just bringing in Christ. Because you will not be able to love your spouse until Christ deals at all levels of your soul, of your heart. That's, for a male, that's true. For a female, true. But there's not one place in the Bible where the Lord tells the female, love your husband. Have you noticed that it only says it to the male? What does it say to the woman? Respect, respect your husband. For you to flourish your husband, you need to respect him. Otherwise, you have him as damaged goods. And for the husband, you need to love your wife the way Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. So many times I, I say, well, you know, I wish I was the one here because I feel like it's an easier task, but I'm not going to say that. And I look at Christ and the love that he has for the church, and I always feel like I feel, fall short. I fall short. Volitional danger. When the crust happens at the volitional center, a a, 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 you know, depth of our life, you are intellectually sound, emotionally free. 
but we have become wither if we refuse to do or to act upon God's will in the painful area of obedience. The last step of discipleship, to act it out, to live it out. Now, there are people who are great at this, and people fakely think that they are Christians. These are why I call Christian activists. People who are very good volitional hearers, but they struggle in the intellectual and the emotional side. So what do they do? They rely on the social gospel and only anything that they can have handle and control on. So wait a minute, I thought this was about faith as well. That's what I'm saying. There's issues in the other part. Napoleon, you guys have heard of Napoleon. Do you know what he said? He was a volitional man. Great men are meteors that consume themselves to light the earth. You say, wow, that almost sounds like Christ. We are the lights of the world. This is my burned out hour. There's no burned out hour for us. They exalt so much of self to come out to light in what they do that I say, I'm going to do as much as possible to that which I believe to do as to lift and to make a name for myself as great as it can be. John the Baptist says, there needs to be more of him and less of me. I guess John the Baptist and Napoleon had different mindsets. Different messages. Repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent for authority is about to enter into you. And this authority will overtake you as the word of God in the new covenant of Jesus Christ through his cross, blood, and resurrection is to write his word on the tablets of your hearts and minds. Burnout hearers are not firmly rooted in intellectual and emotional maturity. They do a lot. You talk to them about truth or anything, they're a mess. You look at their emotional, it's, it's a mess. But they're out there trying to do as much as possible. Another shallow way of responding to the gospel and the word of God. Volitional danger. Obedience without a close relationship with the one we obey will soon become self-generated moralism or activism. I don't know if you guys were aware, but this was a big friction between two of the greatest theologians and missionaries, evangelists, uh, the World Council. You know one of them, his name is Billy Graham. Do you know who the other one is? I'll give you a hint, he's from the UK. John Stott at the World Council in Lausanne. You say, how can this great man not even... Billy Graham said, we're all about evangelism. John Stott said, no, but there needs to be a site of what? Social action as well. Why? To keep that tension, to make sure that we don't separate ourselves from the poor of this world. I know, I've worked with Billy Graham Ministries <laughs> But I believe that John Stott had a little bit of truth in what he said. It wasn't just Billy Graham that was mostly right. Today, why did you come here? To listen? To listen to a guy who has an accent when he preaches? 
No. But for the Lord Jesus to ask you, what is or are the layers or layer or rock that are stopping Jesus and his word from penetrating, healing, ruling, and growing properly in your heart. Now you know what belief means. That's not what you think, I believe. Belief means this area of your heart have been conquered. That is belief. John 7, 38, which stands at the core of my philosophy of ministry. And Jesus said, as scriptures have said, from him who believes in me, rivers of living water shall flow out of his belly, showing that is this inner work of God and his word and his spirit and Christ that will flow out with a life of works, with a life of action, right? Through the empowerment of and the, and the truth of God's spirit in and through our lives. Let's bow our heads and pray as we will close soon. Dear Father, there's been a lot of information today, but Lord, we don't want to lock up the door of our hearts, for you tell us that I stand at the door of your heart and knock. If anyone opens the door, I will come in and dine with him. Lord Jesus, how we need you into our emotional life, into our minds and our thought life, into our volitional side of life, for you to come in, to heal us, to rule over us, to be the authority that guides us and moves us into a fruitful life because you have grafted us into your vine. So Lord, today we ask that we will be able to present to you things that need to be cleansed or pruned from our lives. So we would be fruitful. In Jesus' name we pray, Father. Amen. Let's all rise and respond. i
Jesus is your life. He is inside you to love you and to care for you and to lead you. He is above you to watch over you. He is before you to pave you the way, beside you to befriend you, and behind you to carry you when things are tough. Amen. Please be seated. Uh, we'll be dismissed after a moment of uh, silent meditation. Mm -hmm. 